We have a lot of visitors here with us today, and I, I want you to know that the last Sunday of every month is what we call Aloha Sunday. And on that day, um, we celebrate the Hawaiian culture and tradition, and we always speak to an ancient Hawaiian proverb. These proverbs were collected in a wonderful book written by Dr. Mary Kavenepukui called Olelo no Eau. We find spiritual truth there, and then we find that beautiful place of intersection between the Hawaiian culture and, and the culture that we know in Christianity and in other spiritual paths. Not since 1988 has Easter fallen on an Aloha Sunday. <laughs> so you are very blessed today. That doesn't happen all the time. And what's even more amazing is that the passage, the Hawaiian proverb that I selected for us to talk about today, I believe speaks to the most profound truth of Easter that there is. I'm going to share it with you. The phrase is this, Make no ke kalo, a ola no ika palili. Make is a Hawaiian word meaning to die or death. No means indeed. Ke kalo. Now ke kalo is this. This is a taro plant. The, uh, the older Hawaiian name is kalo. This is an actual taro plant. You can come up and look at it later if you want to see one. Uh, it, so it's the kalo may die. A, uh, which is like however, and ola means life. No, again, is indeed. Ika palili. These little guys growing up on the bottom, these are the palili. The little shoots that are coming from the mother corn, as they say in uh, botany. So what it says is that this, the big taro, the mother, father taro may die, but the little ones live on. Dr. Pukui says it like this, the taro may die, but lives on in the young plants that it produces. I don't know of anything more important for us to remember at Easter than that. Jesus may have died 2,000 years ago. But let's understand that the spirit that he was lives on. And it lives on in the young plants. And guess who those might be? Nudge your neighbor. It's you, honey. He's talking about you. <laughs> this is what a taro field looks like. It's usually the, the wet taro is submerged in water, which is another reason why the water is so important. And there's a picture of one. The taro was so important to Hawaiian people. The taro represents in not only a, 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 the staple food of Hawaiian people, but it was also the center of their social, economic, and mythological lives. The myth of the creation of the taro dates back to, to the god Wakea, was the sky god. And he uh, fell in love with this beautiful young woman named Ho'ohokolani. They had a baby, and that baby was stillborn. She took it, and she buried it at the corner of the house. And every day she came, and she watered it anyway, that graveside. And lo and behold, one day, the kalo started to grow where it had never been in existence before. They had another child, his name was Haloa, and that child became the father of all human beings. So the taro and the father of all people are related, they are siblings, you understand? Only the kalo is the older sibling. And that's very important in Hawaiian culture. For example, when the poi bowl was on the table, and the poi was uncovered, prepared for there, you could not fight, have an argument, say mean words, or do nasty gestures, because that's disrespectful to your elders. And the poi was your elder. It's a powerful story that just shows that when they talk about life coming from when one plant dies and another comes up, it's not just the plant. It's a spiritual, the essence of all existence is happening that way. Jesus said something sort of similar to that when he knew that he was going to be leaving this earth. And he spoke to his disciples like the last time he had a conversation with them in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of John. He says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. 
the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because he is, neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you. And will be in you. Before long the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father. And you are in me. And I am in you. What an amazing thing. What a, a beautiful conjunction of the Hawaiian truth that says, I may die. But my spirit will live on in you. Do you see how it fits so perfectly? Jesus was to many people in, in that culture, as Mary showed in that story, she called him teacher. In the Eastern world, the teacher is also called a guru. Guru is an interesting word. Gu means shadow and ru means dispeller of light. So a guru is the one who takes the shadows in your life and, and brings light to them. And Jesus even at one point said, I am the light of the world. He was the great dispeller. So if you were to tell me that Jesus is your guru, I'd say, fantastic. It also is interesting to note that of all the gurus who have been in the world, and there have been many, they have all said the same thing. That I may die, but my spirit will live on in you. Jesus was not unique in saying that. It's something about the magic of the teaching. It's something about the magic of that spirit, which we'll talk about later, that, sh that still shows through. This is the, a portrait of the famous Indian saint Kabir. I've read a lot of his poems here on Sunday morning. He said it this way, as oil is in the seed, as fire in the flint, your sai or master is within you. Awaken to this if you can. This is an Indian saint saying exactly the same thing. In unity, we have a way of talking about that awakening. We know that that presence and those teachings are there, so waking up to them is powerful. Charles Fillmore is the co-founder of this spiritual movement, and he said there are some things we can do to awaken that spirit within us. He said the first step in the realization of life is always to know that God is life, abundant, omnipresent, eternal. And the second step is to make positive connection with God life by declaring oneness with it. So the two things for you to think about today is, am I willing to accept that that spirit that was in, in, in Jesus, the spirit that was that, we call it the Christ spirit, that spirit that was in all the great gurus of this world, are they available to me within me now? That's the first question. There's nothing you have to do except just know that it's there. And then the second thing Charles Fillmore says is we have to declare that we are one with it. Because I don't know about you, but I have some parts of me that I don't really want to identify with. Yeah, I'm not one with that. <laughs> As Flip Wilson would say, the devil made me do it. How nice if we could say, oh, the spirit of the Christ made me do that. Beautiful, yeah? So what I've done for you is I want to make it easy. I've given everyone today a card, a declaration. It's a declaration of your oneness with that spirit within you. I want you to pull that out if you can, please. We're going to say this together three times. I want you to begin to feel the power of the words as they draw in that connection. What we know and teach is that the spirit of God is already in every single one of you. There's nothing you can do to make it go away. Nothing you can do to make it stay because it's who you are. Our job is to awaken and embrace it, and we do it by speaking these statements of truth together. Let's say this together three times. The life of the Christ lives within me now. Again, the life of the Christ lives within me now. Once more, the life of the Christ lives within me now. Do you feel that? Do you feel some of that? Isn't it amazing? When I think 
think of all my life and what it's come to. I'm convinced that it's the greatest mystery. Just to think the love of God is everywhere and more inside of me. If I started writing now and wrote forever, I know that all my words could not convey the depth of love so great and falling everyone within this place. us life forever for our broken lives God brings us perfect peace from the shackles and the chains the God of love has come to set us free God's always where we are. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that He lives within our hearts? Doesn't it amaze you? Doesn't it amaze you that we find God in this place? Isn't it amazing? It is amazing. <laughs> you may have a question, well, how does, how does that happen? And I think if we look back to the story of the birth of the Taro, we find that it was born out of love. It came from, a, from an act of love. It came from people being in love. And so I think the energy that keeps the young plants growing and the energy that keeps flowing in each of us, the energy that brings that spirit of Jesus from 2,000 years ago and lets it grow inside of us is the spirit of love. Jesus talks about it when he's, uh, it, well, John talks about it in the first book of John. He says, my beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God. <laughs> because why? God is love. And it's not only in, in the context of Jesus and God is love, but I wanted to share with you a reading from uh, one of my own personal gurus too, is Paramahansa Yogananda. 
founder of the Self-Realization Fellowship, in his book, Autobiography of a Yogi, he talks about his relationship with his guru, whose name was Sri Rukteswar. And he gives this little exchange that really talks about how love is important. My master said to me, I will be your friend from now through eternity. No matter whether you are on the lowest mental plane or on the highest plane of wisdom, I will be your friend even if you should err, for then you will need my friendship more than at any other time. When I accepted my master's unconditional love, he said, will you give me the same unconditional love? He gazed at me with childlike trust. I will love you eternally, Gurudev. So I guess what I'm trying to say is if you're trying to figure out how does that happen, how does that energy of, of the Guru, of the great master, how's that energy of the Christ, how does it continue to flow into us and where does that come from? It comes from love. Jesus summed it up and said, go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life and then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this day after day after day right up until the end of the age. To me, that is an amazing example of the power of love. Lord, I come to you, let my heart be changed, renewed. Flowing from the grace that I found in you. And Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love. Unveil my eyes, let me see you face to face the knowledge of your love as you live in me. Lord, renew my mind as your will unfolds in my life. In
What I want you to remember is this. Easter is quite often looked at as a celebration of something that happened 2,000 years ago. But I believe the real resurrection is the one that happens in us when we awaken to that spirit inside. The one that Jesus said would be sent to us, that would always and forever be with us. To me, that is the miracle of Easter. And that, to me, is a story of our resurrection. Will you close your eyes with me for just a moment, please? I'm going to invite you to take a deep breath. All of these things happen inside us. It's not about a God out there somewhere. Jesus said, I am in you and you are in me. Every guru says, I will be in you. So I invite you to go inside yourself. To know first and foremost that that divine and holy presence of God is in you. All that waits is for us to claim it. To embrace it. And then ultimately to be it. In these quiet moments, I ask you to commune with that spirit in you as we all come together collectively in the sacred and holy silence.